Well, in November of 1990, I was a college and high school pastor in California. And I'd always been pro-life, but I wasn't lifting a finger to stop the killing. And I went to this pro-life gathering with a pro-life speaker, and this guy got up, and I am telling you, he gave a very intelligent, very profound presentation. And I thought, this is good, a pro-lifer who doesn't hurt the brain to listen to. But then he did something that I had never experienced before. He showed abortion. I'd never seen it. I sat there and I wept and I thought, I am no different than the priest and the Levite who pass by on the other side of the road in the parable of the Good Samaritan. They may have felt pity for their victim, but they didn't act like they felt pity. And Christ castigates them for that. And I went home and told my wife, I said, I think my whole life has just been summoned. I'm going a different way. And she's like, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> you know. And so here I am 23 years later. And I, what happened was six months after that event, I began teaching and working toward doing pro-life work. And eight months after that, I had left the church and was working full-time training pro-lifers how to make a case in the public square. You know, it's funny. People always want to know, how did I get to do this? What, what did I... What, major did I take? Let me tell you something that's tragic. Name for me one Christian university that has an applied bioethics major aimed at getting pro-life professionals into the field. I'll give you that number. Zero. So I did self-study. And that's good news and bad news. Bad news, no Christian university is doing this. Good news, on your own, using the tools you gain at a place like Summit, you could learn this material and become a very proficient pro-life apologist without ever getting a degree after your name. The books that are out there right now are so good and so in-depth that a lay person can equip themselves to engage at a very sophisticated level in a way that our opponents are not prepared for. I got invited to Summit on a fluke. Uh, in 1997, I had spoke at Focus on the Family Institute that morning, and the guy who had brought me out called up Summit and said, hey, I got this guy named Scott. That uh, Could he come by and just meet you so that maybe in the future you guys could work together? Well, lo and behold, Summit had had a cancellation that afternoon, and they said, meet him. Tell him he can come speak. So suddenly I get two hours to come speak to these students, and I spoke. It went over very well. I got letters of recommendation from the Summit faculty, and then wasn't around for three years. I thought, oh, well, that didn't work too well. Well, unbeknownst to me, they were planning to film me, and indeed, three years later, they filmed me, uh, and that became part of Understanding the Times curriculum, and they would run that video every session at Summit, and the students were all seeing me, even though I wasn't there. Uh, and then what started happening is, maybe about 12 years ago, I got involved with Summit Tennessee, and uh, through John Stone Street, my friend, and others, and I was going out there every session, but still only coming to Colorado, only a little bit here and there, because the program was so packed with existing speakers. So eventually, uh, some of those speakers went on to other things, and I ended up coming to Summit, and uh, for the last four or five years, I think I've been here just about every session, and uh, love it. Well, you know, I picked up debating not through any formal training, but watching people who I thought did a good job. Uh, uh, some of my early mentors in this were people like Greg Cunningham, uh, who just did an excellent job nailing the other side with their own evidence to show that they were misstating the facts. From Greg Kokel, I learned to present arguments that were very cogent and hard-hitting. From Francis J. Beckwith, I learned how to turn certain phrases in a debate that really can help give you the edge. It's something I've just kind of picked up intuitively, and I think that's important for Summit students to understand. You don't have to be a formally trained professional before you can step up in the public square and make your case persuasively. What you can learn on your own, what you can learn being guided by speakers you might hear at Summit, good Christian apologists who are in the field, even some internet sources, can really prep you to, to step up and make those debates effective. The hardest debate experience I had is a debate I did with a guy where I clearly won on content, but I did not win in terms of my mannerisms. My arguments were rock solid. But I was too defensive, a little rigid. But you know what? I don't kick myself over that. Here's why. Uh, it's really true. The credit goes to the person who's actually stepping up to do these things. We're all going to make mistakes 
on stage. We're all going to make mistakes trying to bring glory to God, defending the faith. Nobody does it perfectly, but that is no excuse not to step up and engage, and you just work at being better at it. So even if you do have a presentation that kind of goes south, my best advice to that person is pick yourself up and go do another one right away. Don't sit there and moan in your tears. Uh, by the way, we're not that important. We're millions of people a day sit around and think, boy, Scott really blew it at that debate. You know what? I'm not that important to where they're thinking about it. And I think some of this is a subtle pride where we think, oh, the world thinks I'm so key that they're going to scrutinize everything I do. No, they're not. They're thinking about their own problems. So step up and do the job and just do it better next time. Two things keep me going. Number one, the enormous reality that confronts us. The sheer volume of human beings being killed through elective abortion. And when you're heartbroken over abortion, it forces you to change how you behave. And one of the reasons we don't have more pastors on board on this issue, more Christian leaders on board with this issue, is they're not heartbroken over abortion. Which is why I show images when I speak. People say, well, these are already pro-life students at Summit. Yeah, they are. But are they attitudinally pro-life, but not behaviorally pro-life? You should hear what they say to me after these sessions. I had no idea this is what abortion was. Nobody has ever shown this to me. My youth pastor has never talked about this. My parents have not talked about this. I watched that video and I was transformed by what was going on and it was the images that did it. So that image in my mind of what's actually going on drives me forward. But then there's a second thing that comes through with this. I really enjoy being in front of students. I know I'm not exactly their age, but I get a kick out of it. It's fun for me and I work very hard to be effective at it. I do my homework, I try to have my material down so I can deliver it and connect with them, and I get a charge out of that. I think that's part of the way God wired me. One of the best ways to reach out to this generation is not to become one of them. Surprise them. Do something that's a little out of the ordinary. Not necessarily shocking, but in a way understated. For example, I downplay technology in my talks. I don't use a lot of PowerPoint. I try to pour my energies into connecting with the kids directly. I don't worry about if i am got a lot of glitz going in my talks. Uh, sometimes I'm tempted to put up a flannel board and illustrate that way. Remember those from Sunday school? I think the kids would sit there and go, Wow, that is profound. You know, uh, I think we, we can surprise them uh, by understating the glitz that they're around all the time and giving them content. One of the biggest lies out there is that this generation cannot handle difficult truth. Yes, they can. We're just afraid to raise the bar. They will go to where you lead them. And it's not true they're incapable of processing serious intellectual content. And if there's any place that's proven that, it's Summit that has shown that these kids can handle it. Yes, they can handle the truth. And it really helps when you have faculty members committed to engaging them in a winsome and attractive way. I think it's false. I think we're making progress, but winning is a whole nother matter. Uh, it's true that this generation of students is more open to hearing a pro-life case. I agree. Twenty years ago, it was a much more openly hostile climate. However, just because they're more open to hearing our case does not mean we've carried the day and won it. I think it's damaging to tell students, you're the generation that will end abortion. We don't know that. What I prefer to say is, you're not the generation that will end abortion unless you put yourself in a path toward leadership so that when you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s, the prime decades of your life, you can make such a profound impact that this world has changed forever. But that doesn't happen by accident. That happens through good study, reading, going to good conferences, getting trained, getting equipped, and this is why, again, Summit is so effective, because it puts in those students not just the content, but the desire to learn. In fact, if I had to say, what's the number one benefit of Summit? It's not the content they're getting, though it is important. The number one thing they're getting is they're seeing Christians who love learning. And that is passed on to students and makes them lifetime uh, people who study the important things we need to study to win this culture war.
Well, on the pro-life side, I would recommend our organization, Life Training Institute. We equip pro-lifers to make their case in the public square, and we send our speakers into Catholic and Protestant high schools all over the U.S., and uh, train these kids how to make a case for the pro-life view. And, you know, some people might think that odd. But, well, why does a Christian kid need to hear about abortion? Well, number one, they're not hearing about it in their churches. But number two, we shouldn't assume they share a biblical worldview on this topic. A lot of them don't. They've been influenced by the culture around them. They don't understand that there is a, a view of humanity in play here. here. Here's what's in play. One side says you and I have no intrinsic value we're only valuable for the functions we can perform. The other side, our side, says no, each of us has value simply because we're human. Well, guess what? It's not our side that has the predominant voice right now. It's the critic's side. That means we've got to be equipped to engage that argument in a winsome and pers persuasive way. Yeah, churches have four pro-life responsibilities. Here's the first one. They've got to preach, teach, and counsel that abortion is a sin, that it goes against God's commands, it's the shedding of innocent blood, and it's offensive to our Lord. And it's offensive to our Lord because it intentionally takes a human life. Uh, this is throughout Scripture. Genesis 1 teaches this. Uh, Matthew 5.21 teaches this. Why is Scripture so clear that we're not to shed innocent blood? Because Scripture is clear we bear the image of our Maker. And because we do, you can't just unjustly kill people. The second thing a church has got to do is equip its people to engage the culture. Sure, a pastor can stand up and say, the Bible says the shedding of innocent blood is wrong. But that doesn't work with people who aren't churched. What does the layperson do? Go out into the field and say, hey, all of you, don't have abortions because we're not to shed innocent blood. Scripture says so. Well, believers will buy that, but what about unbelievers? We've got to make a case for the pro-life view based on science and philosophy that conveys a biblical worldview, but doesn't do so by citing chapter and verses. So we've got to equip our people to engage. Third thing we've got to do, and oh, this is critical. We have got to give hope to men and women wounded by abortion. And you know what a lot of churches do? They ignore abortion. A pastor once came to me and said, I'm really nervous about you speaking tonight because I know there's women in my church who've had abortions. I want to spare them guilt. And I said to him, Pastor, if we don't do this presentation, you're not sparing women guilt, you're sparing them healing because unconfessed sin has them out of full fellowship with Jesus. You know, right after that presentation, a woman came up and grabbed my hand and I didn't think she was going to let go of it. And she said, Thank you for coming. That video you showed was very hard to view, but I, I'm so glad you, you talked and showed that film because I had an abortion when I was 19. Oh, and by the way, you met my husband. He's the pastor you spoke to before the, the, the session tonight. Now, it wasn't his kid. It was another boyfriend's. But that woman, here she was, a believer, married to a pastor, but had an unresolved abortion affecting her fellowship with Jesus. When the church covers up abortion, we don't heal people. We spare them the healing they need because they're not dealing forthrightly with their sin. And then the, the final thing the church needs to do is put people into the field full-time as pro-life ambassadors to this culture. We encourage people to go to Africa. We encourage them to go to Europe on mission trips, as we should. But what about training people to be ambassadors in this culture to convey a winsome pro-life message to a world that desperately needs it? We use a little acronym called SLED that is not meant to be a slam dunk argument for the pro-life side, but to make the point that there's no essential difference between the embryo you were and the adult you are today that justifies killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, meaning where we are, and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying you could be killed then but not now. So let's, let's just walk through this. Size, there's your S in that acronym. You were smaller as an embryo, but since when does body size determine value? We don't think Shaquille O'Neal is more human than all of us because he's a foot taller than everybody in this room. Uh, level of development, of course you're less developed as an embryo. So what? Tell me why that matters. Two-year-old girls do not even have a reproductive system that's developed. Does it follow they're less valuable than the 21-year-old woman who does? What about your environment? How does where you are determine what you are? When you walked from your car to this studio, you changed location, you didn't stop being you. If that's true, how does a journey of eight inches down the birth canal suddenly transform you from non-human, non-valuable thing we can kill to valuable human being we can't? 
And the answer is, if you weren't already human and valuable, you're not going to get there by changing your address. And finally, degree of dependency. Sure, you depended on your mother for survival, but tell me again why that means we can kill you. There are some newborns that are born unable to tolerate infant formula. They can only tolerate their own mother's milk. Would it be okay for the mother to say, hey kid, too bad. My body, my choice, you depend totally on me for survival. I'm not going to feed you. I'm just going to unplug you and let you die. I think we'd consider that barbaric. Uh, it is barbaric to not let your own child use your body in that way. So size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, and we say not one of those uh, is a good reason for killing you then, but not killing you now. That SLED acronym, what Stephen Schwartz came up with, really helps us focus on these differences being non-essential. Yeah, there have been people who try to counter that SLED acronym, and they'll say things like, well, it doesn't matter, the mother has a right to bodily autonomy that trumps everything else, so even if the fetus is human, so what? Um, the mother may withhold support if she wants. But here's the problem. Abortion is much more than merely withholding support. It's intentionally killing another human being through dismemberment, poisoning. I think Frank Beckwith puts it well. He says, listen, calling abortion merely the, the withholding of support is kind of like suffocating someone with a pillow and calling it the withdrawing of oxygen. I mean, there's a whole lot more going on here than merely withholding support. Uh, if I am a parent of a terminally ill child, and that child needs a blood transfusion, I suppose I could decide not to give it. I could withhold that support. I cannot slit my child's throat in the name of denying her my support. And that's what abortion is. And I don't think that argument works, but that's typically how people try to get around this. Well, here's how we approach end of life. It is the same moral reasoning that involves beginning of life, and it's this. We argue that killing the unborn is wrong because the unborn have intrinsic value, meaning they have an inalienable right to life. If you have a right that is intrinsic, you don't get rid of it just because you don't want it. You can't just say, oh, I don't want it. I'm giving it up. No, it's you have it, period. And so when someone says, I have a right, to doctor-assisted suicide, well, where does that right come from? It can't come from our intrinsic natures. It can't come from our fundamental rights. So where does it come from? I think people are plucking these things out of thin air is what they're doing. Um, and so what I point out to people is the reason why, historically, the state will not allow you to kill yourself is because it recognizes, going back to the Declaration of Independence, that you have what are known as fundamental rights, basic natural rights that transcend your own desires. You can't negotiate them away. They're with you whether you want them or not. So the fact that someone wants to die does not override their inalienable right to life because that's part of their nature. And I think because we've lost track with natural rights, these arguments people don't understand anymore. They think, well, I want it, therefore I must be allowed to do it. And rights talk now means I want this, therefore I ought to be allowed to do it. I have a right to do it. But says who? Yeah, that's a real important question. How do we know when to withhold or continue treatment with a terminal patient? And the short answer to that question is this. Does the treatment still benefit the patient? The question is not, do we think the patient's life is valuable? Doctors are not in a position to answer the value question. They can answer the treatment question. Will this treatment be of value to the patient. They can't say that the patient has value or doesn't have value. And so my answer is always this. In dealing with end-of-life issues, we are under no obligation to prolong life at all costs. Hey, we are all going to die at some point. We are all going there. No exceptions. The question is this. When we reach that point, is the treatment that's being offered truly benefiting us or is it really something that isn't benefiting us? For example, imagine a cancer uh, patient in the final stages of cancer. Uh, food and nutrition, water, no longer helping the patient at all, only prolonging agony. Should we force that on them? No, I don't think so. And here's the key point. In withholding the treatment, it's not our intent to kill the patient. 
We're trying to make the patient as comfortable as possible while he or she is dying from the underlying illness. And it's the underlying illness that is killing the patient, not our withdrawing of certain treatments. Now it is true in withdrawing the treatment, we can foresee that death may be hastened, but it's not the intention of the physician. He's trying to make the patient as comfortable as possible. Well, I would encourage all students to start looking for Christian universities with grad programs that can equip them in worldview issues, apologetics, um, philosophy. We need more Christian students taking on graduate work in philosophy so they can make an impact in the academy. Ideas, as John loves to point out, ideas always have consequences. Uh, he's not the only one who points that out, but it's a very true point. If we're going to impact the idea realm, we've got to have Christians at the highest levels of academia. And what has happened is, over the last 150 years, there's been a real creeping anti-intellectualism that's come into the church. And what it's done is say, listen, study, intellect, these are bad things. We need faith. And faith is presented as transrational, but that's not the biblical definition of faith. The biblical definition of faith is trust based on evidence, not blind faith. So I would encourage students, move toward a graduate program where you can learn this stuff and become a really equipped, skilled ambassador at the highest levels. I'm glad we have guys like Francis J. Beckwith and guys like Robbie George and guys like Kevin Bywater and others who have really studied hard to master their craft and have invested academically to do that. We need those guys. They provide the intellectual cover for us and we need students to step up into those ranks. I think a lot of people think that Hobby Lobby was about my right to go get birth control, to go get contraception, and evil companies like Hobby Lobby are preventing me from getting contraception. This was not an access question. It was a question of who's going to pay for it. And Hobby Lobby paid for, in their health plans, 16 kinds of contraception for their employees. There were four kinds they did not fund that are abortifacient in nature. Drugs like Ella that cause the death of a developing human once it's begun. They aren't opposed and weren't arguing that you can't have contraception or go buy it yourself if you work for Hobby Lobby. This was a, a, a situation where the left wanted to force a company to fund abortifacient processes for their employees against the will of the owners who control the company. And thankfully, the right ending happened on this case. But it, it, the way it impacts the abortion debate is this. A lot of people think that a refusal of a company to pay for contraception means that all of their rights are gone. And there is a group of people today who think if they don't have a right to kill their unborn children, they have no basic rights whatsoever. That's a real sad state of affairs. Well, let me talk about the two that are most known. I think that'd be most helpful. Uh, the first is Ella. Ella is a drug that works like RU486, meaning once the embryo comes into being, it poisons the environment of the uh, embryo and causes an early miscarriage. Uh, that drug has an intrinsic purpose of doing this. So Hobby Lobby says, listen, uh, we don't want this. We, this is not what we want. Unlike Plan B, where it's debatable whether it causes abortion or not, there is no debate on Ella. It's clear what it does. And what was in play here was forcing a company to provide that for their employees and go against what they believed to be the taking of innocent human life just so the left could have a notch on its hat about forcing this down the throat of that company. That, that's just despicable to me. Uh, the other uh, kind of abortifacient drug in play here would be RU46, which works to, um, again, kill the developing embryo, but a little later in the pregnancy, and causing a miscarriage, a two-step process where the woman takes one pill that kills the embryo, takes another pill that induces early labor, and she often passes the early fetus at home, alone. Uh, and Hobby Lobby wants no part of any abortifacient drugs that might have that effect, uh, want no part of anything that could provoke the intentional killing of an innocent human being. And why aren't they entitled to that? P. 
people can be well-versed as pro-life apologists, even if that's not their major, even if that's not the area they're going to specialize in. And they just need to know a couple of things. They need to know, number one, how to bring this issue back to the question, what is the unborn? That brings moral clarity to the issue. This is not a debate over trusting women, not a debate over uh, are we forcing morals on people. It's not a debate over who decides. It's a question of what is the unborn. Can we kill the unborn? Well, that depends. What is the unborn? Secondly, students need to know how to make a scientific and philosophic case for the pro-life view. Here's how you can do that in one minute or less. We argue from science that the unborn, from the very beginning, are distinct, living, and whole human beings. We argue philosophically that there's no essential difference between that embryo you were and the adult you are today that justifies killing you at that earlier stage. Differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying you could be killed then but not now. What did that take? 40 seconds? Now notice I didn't cite scripture. I didn't go into a long treatise. I just stated what the pro-life view was. I made an argument, made it quickly, but I laid something out there that can't just be dismissed as a private religious view. Our critics have to engage that argument. Now maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my argument isn't good. My science might be bad. My philosophy might be bad, but my critic needs to step up and show me where it's bad. It's not enough for him to say, oh, well, that's just your personal private view. They've got to engage the actual argument I'm making. And students can be trained to do that even if they don't specialize in pro-life apologetics, which is why I'm so glad Summit does this. Because every student coming to Summit learns how to make a case for the pro-life view that is concise, winsome, and attractive. We absolutely must be involved politically. Uh, listen, how do you define victory on the pro-life side? It's not just changing hearts if the act of abortion remains legal. How is pro-life victory defined? Let me define it. When unborn children are protected in law. Until that day, we've not won this fight. So we must engage politically to work toward that end. It's not all we do, but it's a huge part of what we do. Uh, imagine a society that said, okay, we all agree that slavery is something that shouldn't be done, but we're going to keep it legal anyway. That would still be a deeply immoral society. And the same is true here with abortion. As far as whether we work politically for an outright ban or work politically incrementally, I'm an incrementalist. It's not possible to have an outright ban right now. The federal courts would immediately enjoin it and throw it out based on Roe v. Wade and the Casey decision and other legal precedents. So you're going to have to change some seats on the Supreme Court before you can get that full legal protection. In the meantime, the question becomes, what's our duty? Well, here's our duty. Our duty is to work to limit the evil insofar as possible given the challenges and constraints we face. If I can't stop the evil outright, I will work to limit it to the extent I can given the constraints facing me. So, for example, if I'm looking at a situation where I've got two imperfect candidates, but I've got one that will do a better job promoting the good over the evil than the other one will do, I will take the imperfect candidate over the one that's going to be a wholesale uh, person promoting evil in the culture. Uh, Greg Kokel puts it real well. If, you, if you're given a choice between a first-class arsonist and a second-class fireman, you go with a second-class fireman. And I think a lot of Christians, when it comes to voting, they think, oh, if the candidate isn't perfect, I'm compromising if I vote for him. No, you're not responsible for the evil he may do while in office. You don't intend any of the evil he may do. Your intent is to limit the evil that will happen if he's not in office. And that's what you're held responsible for. A, a good parallel example, suppose you're uh, at a bank and you're a teller and a guy comes in with a gun and says, hey, I'm, I'm blowing this place up. I'm going to kill everybody in here unless you empty your drawer and give me the cash. You going to do it? Of course you are. Did you cooperate with his evil? Well, in one sense you did. That's what we call informal cooperation. You didn't intend any evil that he did. In one sense, you did cooperate with the evil because you gave him the money. But you didn't intend that evil. You were just working to prevent an even greater evil. And the greatest good you could do in that situation was to stop innocent people from being killed. That doesn't mean you're responsible for the evil the guy did. And in the same way, when you vote for a candidate who's less than perfect or a party that's less than perfect, but will do a better job limiting the evil over one that 
wants to promote it wholesale, well, you should work to limit the evil insofar as possible. Here is the frontline biotechnology debate. Will humans biologically work to alter their nature and enhance it, literally transform themselves, or are we going to use biotech to repair damage and restore the natural position of the human person? And so the debate over whether it's enhancement or repair is only going to intensify. And here's the problem. I'm not against biotechnology per se. Listen, you've got somebody who is carrying a gene that is destructive and we have a way to repair that so it doesn't affect them adversely, why wouldn't we want to do that? But when we talk about altering the biological nature of human beings to enhance ourselves so that we can be faster, think clearer, get an advantage over people, now we're into really dangerous territory. Why were people so angry at many players in Major League Baseball 10 years ago who were hitting all these home runs and had grown to the size of elephants uh, who were once, you know, these skinny little dudes, right? They're hitting all these home runs, and then we found out why. They had been taking the juice, and we were outraged over it. The public was outraged over it. Well, couldn't they argue, well, what's wrong with enhancement? So the very people who want to tell us, hey, you know, it's okay to alter the biological nature of human beings seem to throw a fit when a baseball player enhances his ability to swing at the baseball. So that's going to be the debate. The debate that is really coming down the pike right now is what does it mean to be human? Because the debate over human nature is up for grabs. And this is one of the reasons our churches have to engage. What happens to the gospel when the very definition of what it means to be human is up for grabs? Who's the gospel written to? Human beings. It's kind of hard to argue that humans must repent of their rebellion against their maker, must turn in faith to the living God, must reject what they hold to as their own personal idols, and pursue Christ with a full heart of enthusiasm when nobody knows what a human is anymore. That is a scary place we're in right now. And when I see churches just checking out and saying, I, I, we're just going to focus on what people like, man, I don't think they understand the danger.